Vin Future Prize, a new global science and technology prize for humanity from Vietnam. One Vin Future Grand Prize of $3 million. Three additional special Vin Future Prizes valued at $500,000 each. Vin Future Prize honors science and technology work that creates or has a high potential to create meaningful change in the everyday lives of millions of people. Join us to make a change for a better future. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and our beloved scientists. Thank you for joining us on the last episode of the Vin Future webinar series, Innovate Talk 2022. And uh, we are so lucky, we feel so grateful to have all of you here in the last episode. We have come a long way since the last um, six months to discuss in-depth science, to innovators and technology. And I'm Chiang, I'm the Communications and Marketing Senior Manager of the Wind Future Foundation. I'm very lucky to accompany all of you, our audience, science um, enthusiasts and also our scientists in this journey. Today, we are going to explore a new class of uh, monitoring technology, wireless skin integrated uh, sensors that provide us with precise real-time physiological data. And um, what do you think about um, things like uh, in science movie, science fiction movie, we have a stretchable garment and also self heal garments like in the Avengers. What do you think about that? And today we are going to discuss about a kind of materials that have the same uh, skin like properties like that. Uh, and with science, we are going to bring those um, concepts into the real life. And today we will focus on steps from engineering and clinical trials to commercialization of soft, flexible and wireless electronics and microfluidic system uh, in biomedicine by providing monitor health and disease uh, status whenever you want and wherever you are. We are very delighted to have the participation of all the scientific pioneers in this field. They are very um, talented and uh, they had um, contributed a lot of achievement in this field, in this field of organic polymer-based electronics. Let's, let us welcome the chair of today's webinar, Professor Jen and Bao, Vin Future Inaugural Laureates of Special Prize for Female Innovators, KK Lee Professor of Chemical Engineering, Department of Chemical Engineering and Biocourtesy, Professor of Chemistry and Professor of Material Science and Engineering, Stanford University. Welcome to our uh, webinar today. And please welcome distinguished speaker of today's webinar, Professor John A. Rogers, Lewis Simpson and Kimberly Curie, Professor of Material Science and Engineering Department, Biomedical Engineering and Medicine Department, Director of Curie Simpson Institute for Bioelectronics, Northwestern University. Thank you so much. We know that today uh, you are in France and, and, and it's now 3 a.m. in the morning uh, in your time. So we really appreciate your, uh, your participation and also all of your support for us. And right now we will come back to uh, the webinar today. We will start our webinar with an introduction video and then we will have the introduction from our chair of the webinar, Professor Jin and Bao. Video please. The skin is the body's largest organ. It carries out three main functions, protecting, regulating and sensing. Human skin has complex properties and functions and is in a continuous change due to environmental, biochemical, and psychological factors which are very challenging to replicate or replace. However, chemistry nowadays can make a difference in terms of creating new materials and enable new properties. From that, scientists around the world have developed the idea of skin-inspired electronics that add human skin to interactive devices and promises new human-machine integration. The invention and development of skin-integrated materials are applicable in various fields of advanced robotics, prosthetics, and health monitoring technologies. Humans have opened the door to mimic the sense of touch, monitor nerve signals and vital signs, implant sensors into organs, and much more. Coming to the last episode of the Vin Future InnovaTalk series, you will learn about the epidermal electronics and skin-like wearable microfluidic solutions in healthcare. 
The webinar will be chaired by a pioneer of electronic skin technologies, Professor Zenan Bao, Vin Future Inaugural Laureate of Special Prize for Female Innovators, K.K. Lee, Professor of Chemical Engineering, Department of Chemical Engineering, and by courtesy, Professor of Chemistry and Professor of Material Science and Engineering, Stanford University. Our vision for the future of electronics is uh, they're going to be invisible, biocompatible, and imperceptible. Uh, so we imagine that uh, using a type of material that will mimic the skin properties will enable us to achieve that goal. And our speaker, Professor John A. Rogers, Lewis Simpson and Kimberly Query Professor of Material Science and Engineering Department, Biomedical Engineering and Medicine Department, Director of Query Simpson Institute for Bioelectronics, Northwestern University will share about tracking and monitoring our health through soft, wireless, flexible electronics that have already made its ways into deployments on a global scale. These skin-like, battery-free wireless devices is to make the wires go away. I don't think there's ever been a device that's this thin, this soft, this functional in this form factor before. So I think we're breaking new ground at multiple uh, aspects of the underlying engineering science that enables these devices. Besides, his lab also worked on microfluidic systems, which overcome the limitations of sweat testing. And our goal was to develop a new kind of technology, a thin, skin-like, soft device platform that can uh, integrate directly with the skin uh, and capture sweat and perform colorimetric analysis of key biomarkers for the purposes of, of health and wellness determinations. The emerging field of soft electronics and microfluidic systems for skin offers the possibility of monitoring and diagnosing health problems, a potentially revolutionary approach that can be applied for healthcare advancements. Join our last InnovaTalk webinar to discover this novel technology on November 22nd, 9 a.m. Vietnam time, which corresponds to November 21st, 2022 at 6 p.m. in Stanford and 8 p.m. in Chicago. Good afternoon and a good morning everyone around the world. It's uh, my pleasure to be here to introduce uh, our speaker today and also the topic of uh, today's webinar. Uh, Professor John Rogers is really the pioneer and the creator of the field of uh, soft electronics uh, and uh, its applications uh, to interface with human skin and human body. Soft electronics uh, is a unique class of electronics. Uh, unlike traditional electronics, which are rigid and brittle, soft electronics uh, can bend, twist, and stretch. They can also be made biodegradable or even self-healing. Professor Rogers uh, recognized the unique opportunities of using soft electronics to enable minimally invasive um, uh, integration with uh, soft tissue of the human body. Professor Rogers uh, has developed uh, unique biocompatible forms of electronics, optoelectronics, and microfluidic systems. His devices uh, have transformed our applications for how technology can be used for treating diseases and disorders. His team is highly interdisciplinary, integrates uh, fundamental and applied science as the foundation for materials and devices that address key challenges in patient care and biomedical research. Next, let me introduce uh, Professor John Rogers' uh, career path. Uh, Professor John Rogers uh, got his uh, bachelor's degree from University of Texas, Austin in 1989. He subsequently obtained his PhD degree in physical chemistry from MIT in 1995. From 95 to 97, Professor Rogers was a junior fellow in the Harvard University Society of Fellows. During that time, he also served uh, uh, as a founder and a director of Active Impulse Systems, 
which was a company that he started to commercialize uh, the work he performed during his PhD. And my path crossed with uh, Professor John Rogers when he joined the Bell Laboratories, where I was also a member of technical staff. And he joined in 1997 and later served as a director of the uh, Department for Condensed Matter Physics Research in Bell Laboratories. And uh, I frequently, um, very proudly uh, tell my students that I not only collaborated with Professor John Rogers, but also our collaboration was not just on paper. Uh, we actually worked side by side in the lab um, and the handing samples back and forth. And both of us uh, putting real experimental time into the uh, uh, electronic first electronic paper that we uh, demonstrated. From 2003 to 2016, uh, Professor Rogers uh, joined the faculty at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he held the Swanland chair position, the highest chair position at the university. And he had a joint appointment with um, four different departments, including the um, material science department, uh, Department of Chemistry, Bioengineering, Mechanical Engineering, Electrical Engineering, and Computer uh, Science and Engineering. In September of uh, 2016, he joined the Northwestern University as the Lewis Simpson and the Kimberly Quarry Professor of Material Science and Engineering. And uh, again, he held uh, multiple joint appointments uh, with uh, uh, various departments, including six different departments. He now serves as the funding director of the Quarry Simpson Institute of Bioelectronics. Professor Rogers' research include fundamental and applied aspects of nano and molecular scale fabrication, as well as materials and patterning techniques for unusual electronic and photonic devices with an emphasis on bio-integrated and bio-inspired systems. He has published more than 800 papers, is inventor over 100 patents, and more than 70 of them have been licensed and in active use by either large companies or startups that he has co-funded. His uh, research has been recognized by many, research, uh, by many awards, including his one of the very few individuals who is a member of uh, three different academies, including the National Academy of Science, National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Medicine. I won't be able to cover all the awards he has uh, uh, received, uh, just to highlight a few, including McCarthy Fellowship um, uh, from the MacArthur Foundation, uh, which is also called Genius Award in 20, uh, uh, 2009, the Lemerson MIT Prize, uh, in uh, 2011, the Mid-Korea Research Award from Material Society, uh, and more recently, very recently, the James Price in Science and Technology Integration from the National Academy of Science, which cites for uh, Professor Rogers' innovative research in science, engineering, and medicine has established diverse classes of bio-integrated technologies with capabilities for improving health and increasing our understanding of living systems. So without further ado, let's hear from Professor Rogers on his research. Great, Th thank you, Janan, for that uh, wonderful introduction. It bring back, uh, brought back some great memories from our time together at Bell Laboratories 25 years ago at this point. It seems like a long time ago, but at some level, it seems like it was just yesterday. Those are, those are great times to be in the lab uh, together and working on really tough, but, but challenging and interesting topics in, in science and, and engineering. So, so it's great to be here. I, I also wanna thank the uh, organizers for, for giving me this this chance to share with this community some some of the things that we've been doing in this area of bio integrated devices skin inter interface devices specifically for the discussion today and um, and to just give you a sense of the status of, of the technology you know we and Janan's group and, and many others around the world have been working in this space for for some years and um, I think we're reaching a point now where 
you know, some of the academic discoveries can can move out of the lab, you know, in, into the real world where it can uh, really impact uh, people's lives. And, and, and that's kind of what I want to share with you, just kind of a glimpse into the uh, current state of the art. Uh, and, and where things might might be going in, into the future. So I'll go ahead and share my uh, screen. And I think I have 15 minutes or so to just quickly uh, give, give you an overview of where things stand, um, you know, in terms of the technology foundations and, um, you know, where, where things are going uh, in, in terms of um, clinical and commercial uh, uses of these technologies, both, both uh, you know, electronic uh, systems as well as uh, mi microfluidic uh, devices as well. So, so there won't be a tremendous emphasis on on the underlying science, but but I do want to touch on that briefly. Uh, instead, uh, you know, th this time is going to be focused on uh, how how to move these things out of the lab uh, and and into broader deployments where where they can really impact uh, pe people's lives. So, as Jean uh, mentioned, uh, you know, I have appointments in in a number of different departments. Uh, here at Northwestern. Um, my core expertise, though, is in material science uh, and engineering. But but as you'll see in this presentation, we blend in various aspects of biomedical engineering, mechanical, electrical engineering, chemistry, physics. I have appointments in our medical school as well. And um, I'll just give you a sense of how all of those disciplinary activities come together uh, to, to you know, establish what, what we think is, is a new and exciting technology. And, and we're just one group among, you know, several around the world who are working in this space. But, you know, th this talk will kind of focus on on what uh, what we're fo uh, wor working on uh, the, these days. So as Janan mentioned, you know, her group and my group and others are very interested in the question of how we can, um, you know, create an <coughs> electronic technology uh, that looks more like biology, that, that's more compatible with soft living tissues of, of the human body, uh, where, where the goal is to kind of merge electronics with, with the body uh, to, to provide, you know, a, a new foundation for doing uh, clinical health care, for, for monitoring body processes, for, for delivering forms of therapies that can complement traditional uh, drug-based uh, treatment approaches and, and really establish, you know, options for, for how to care for patients with, with an uh, emphasis on how to improve outcomes and, and also to reduce costs uh, as an important uh, aspect of, of how we think about health care in the future. And uh, you, you can uh, envision many opportunities, you know, across the body uh, for, you know, that kind of integration, not just electronic electronics, but micro, microfluidics and optoelectronics, all sorts of man-made microsystems with the body. The brain might be an interesting starting point in thinking about how electronics can be brought to bear on you know, processes of the human body, but, but not just the brain, all sorts of other vital organs uh, within the body, uh, the cardiac system, uh, the lungs, the liver, the diaphragm, the kidney, the spinal cord, the peripheral nerve, we're active in all of those areas. Other groups are also doing doing great work there. But but I'll focus on um, you know, kind of a, a minimally invasive interface to the body through the, the skin, which, which is the body's uh, largest organ, and specifically in the development of skin-like electronic systems that um, and microfluidic uh, platforms that they can interface with it really uh, you know any cr uh, location across the body where, where the skin is uh, used as a as a mounting uh, location for uh, monitoring underlying processes or, or capturing small volumes of sweat for uh, biomarker analysis as I'll describe you know in the next uh, 10, 10 minutes or so and so the the challenge is is pretty daunting if you think about it you know all of the best and most well-developed man-made microsystems, again, not just you know, integrated circuits and electronics, but optoelectronics, photonic systems, microelectromechanical systems, lab on a chip type diagnostic uh, platforms are, are built on rigid planar uh, substrate surfaces, uh, semiconductor wafers or, or glass uh, based uh, substrates, uh, really wonderfully matched to the very sophisticated forms of uh, manufacturing that kind of support uh, the industries uh, in, in those various areas. And, and also are compatible with the kinds of materials that offer the highest performance uh, characteristics, but but those physical properties are dramatically different uh, than those of soft uh, li living um, uh, organisms. And, and so the, the challenge from a materials chemistry and maybe material science standpoint is how to reformulate this technology to look more like biology, as I mentioned before, and specifically in the context of this presentation, how do I make that kind of um, you know, integrated circuit system uh, adopt the physical properties of the, of the epidermis? In terms of its thickness, its mechanical properties, its mass, its water vapor permeability, and uh, th thermal characteristics as well, and uh, you can think about that as a real huge opportunity for doing innovative uh, research in, in materials chemistry and, and materials uh, materials science, where where the solution might involve kind of a blend of hard and soft materials together. 
uh, to form systems that, that offer high performance characteristics and, and where possible leverage the most advanced uh, materials for, for electronics and, and these other microsystems technologies, but, but blend it together with soft materials to achieve the kind of physical properties you ultimately need for body integration. And that's kind of a strategy that, that we've been pursuing over the last 10, 12 years or so, where you're taking, you know, from a material science standpoint, uh, hard materials, integrating with soft materials. You think about these as hybrid material systems or deterministic composites, where you think about, you know, how to lay out these materials to support the kind of electronic functionality you ultimately want to achieve. But, but in layouts and geometries and blended with soft materials in a way that gives you a, a system level set of physical properties that match, you know, a point of integration across the body skin for the purposes of this presentation. So over the last 10 you know, years or so, we, we've been working uh, along that path and um, you have developed what we think are some pretty robust uh, platforms of that sort uh, that can be engineered to address real uh, clinical needs. And that, that's what I'll share with you today. I think we felt pretty comfortable with, with different approaches that, that uh, you know, realized that goal back in 2011, got better uh, over the years. And, and starting around 2015, 2016, begin to ask the question, okay, you have this new technology, these new materials approaches, what is it good for? You know, how can it be used to improve patient lives? And, and that, that's what we began to focus on. And, and thinking about different kinds of sensor modalities that can be integrated in those devices, different kinds of mounting locations across the body, wireless communication protocols that would allow for a kind of clinical grade monitoring, but but outside of a hospital setting and, and done continuously uh, to, to yield uh, very large data sets that, that can then be mined, not only to determine, uh, you know, instantaneous health status, but maybe in the future, um, you know, establish a, a method for doing pre uh, predictive uh, health assessments uh, to, to determine uh, risks at, at the very earliest uh, stages. And so so that that's what we and others uh, have been doing. Each one of those devices can incorporate many different types of sensors, and there are hundreds of papers that have been produced uh, by, by groups uh, around the world, very, very clever uh, designs and sensors of thermal, electrical, fluidic, mechanical, optical, mechanoacoustic characteristics of uh, underlying physiological processes, all measured from the surface of the skin using these skin-like uh, platforms. So each one of them can include multiple sensor types, so they're multimodal, uh, but they can also be wirelessly networked together. So you can distribute uh, you know, several of these devices at different locations across the body, time synchronized wireless uh, you know, data capture allow kind of full body assessments of, of health status where you know important goal is to establish clinical quality you know in the acquired data so physicians can uh, read and interpret and act upon uh, this information uh, collected continuously at a cost point that uh, makes it available to everyone not not just uh, you know highly developed uh, rich countries uh, across the world but but even the most resource constrained areas of the globe and that's kind of what we've uh, been able to do uh, at least move it uh, aggressively in that direction over the last four or five years, starting with what we felt like was the most compelling application opportunity, the most vulnerable of our patients that you would encounter in a hospital, premature babies, which require full vital signs monitoring, uh, you know, ar around the clock uh, every every day continuously, but but uh, which is done with, with a really lousy engineering solution, taped on biosensors, hardwired connections to external boxes of data acquisition, electronics, highly problematic uh, for this class of patient. And we figured, you know, around 2015, 2016, if we could really make this skin-like technology work, we'd get rid of all of that uh, you know, rat's nest of wires and the invasive tapes and so on, the expensive data acquisition systems, and, and replace all of that with two or three of these skin-like wireless devices. And that really set us down a path around engineering science to see if we could do that and uh, whether we could take that te technology out of the lab uh, as well and, and, and deploy it, you know, at a, at a global scale. And, and so that, that's kind of what, what we've been able to do at some level. Uh, this is a picture of a, a pair of devices that we published in spring 2019 that actually capture all of, all of the vital signs that are monitored, even in the most uh, advanced neonatal intensive care units here, here in the U.S. It's a chest uh, device that goes on the chest uh, that measures cardiopulmonary uh, characteristics of uh, associated with vital signs, and then one that goes on the limb that measures blood oxygenation. And these are skin-like devices using the design approaches, these hybrid material systems, hard, soft, deterministic composites that I described to you uh, before, but really engineered to address the, the critical needs of, of these vulnerable patients. This is an example of a device on a 26-week gestational age premature baby at Lurie Children's Hospital here in Chicago. You can see the device on the chest. We're monitoring uh, vital signs there, ECG, so cardiac 
uh, activity, uh, core body uh, temperature, respiratory cycles as well. And we can capture the data and then correlate it and compare it to um, you know, data captured using the standard wired-based systems, which is what you're seeing uh, there. So that was quite successful. Done about uh, 200 babies in the NICU at uh, Lurie Children's Hospital, Princess Women's Hospital. We've actually expanded that into the, the PICU. This is pediatric intensive care unit. You can see the device on the chest of the infant. Uh, that's measuring heart rate, heart rate variability, respiration rate, core body temperature, and then the device on the foot uh, is an optoelectronic system that's measuring blood oxygenation. And both of those devices are operating in a wireless, battery-free manner, time synchronized. So we actually get hemodynamic uh, information as well, which is actually going beyond what's standard of care uh, in, in the NICU. And, and this is the kind of data that, that you can capture. And I won't go through the details here. We just make the comment that it's all clinical grade. It's actually higher quality uh, in terms of the, the data and the signal to noise and the reliability and so on than uh, that which is possible with these wired-based interfaces because of the elimination of the motion artifacts imposed by, by those wired uh, connections. So, so this is uh, kind, of, kind of what it looks like. Um, shortly after we published that first paper in 2019, we were approached by uh, program managers at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Save the Children organization, asking us if we could re-engineer those systems to allow cost-effective deployment into lower and middle-income countries. And that turned out to be a really interesting challenge in engineering science that we're able to solve and, and um, you know, really deploy, uh, you know, at a global scale in India, Pakistan, Zambia, Kenya, and Ghana starting late 2019, early 2020, moved into Mexico as well. Uh, and those, those deployments uh, continue. And the, the details are described in this paper, which is published in spring of uh, 2020. There's a couple of my students in Zambia actually training healthcare workers in, in uh, Zambian health clinics on how to use these uh, devices. And so thousands of patients have been monitored up to this point. You can actually extend those devices to, to um, apply to maternal and fetal health as well as a very natural extension of monitoring of neonatal and pediatric health. And so there you're distributing devices across a, a pregnant woman to monitor her health and the health of the uh, fetus during that intrapartum period, dur during the birth process itself uh, to, to improve the care of these patients and reduce mortality associated with childbirth. And so we've deployed those devices also in partnership with the Gates Foundation in those same countries and have captured, uh, you know, uh, data from hundreds of pregnant women uh, through the entire birth process. So you can begin to see how, you know, there, there may be a data in enabled future of, of how to care for these uh, patients, where you're not only monitoring the, the health status of the patient, but you're using big data um, machine learning algorithms to get a sense of the health trajectory of the, of the individual uh, as well. And so, th so this is a collection of uh, data from nearly 500 pregnant women throughout the birth process uh, captured in Zambia that we published last uh, year. And so from the standpoint of commercialization, we have a small company, really very engineering in its orientation, uh, but, but have monitored, uh, you know, approaching 15,000 and patients, FDA cleared, active in 20 countries and so on. So at the last two minutes, let me just describe another platform a little bit earlier in that commercialization process, but still one where we have uh, a lot of traction. And, and that's it. answering the question is what kind of additional information you could capture from the surface of the skin beyond sort of biophysical measurements. Could you capture tiny volumes of sweat and then measure chemical uh, uh, you know, biomarkers in, in sweat? And, and that, that turned out to be an interesting uh, challenge, again, in, in engineering science. How do you reformulate lab on a chip type diagnostic technologies to, to enable deployment on, on the skin? And so we developed soft forms of microfluidic devices that interface with the surface of the skin and capture very tiny volumes of sweat. And then colorimetric chemical reagents that change in color by an amount that's uh, correlated to the concentrations of those biomarkers as, as additional information uh, around health status. This is one of these devices. You can actually capture the sweat rate, the sweat loss, and, and various biomarkers, in this case, lactate, glucose, chloride and pH sweat using these color changing uh, chemistries. This is what one of the devices looks like on the outer forearm. Uh, you can see the sweat filling into that uh, serpentine channel. It's also filling into those circular reservoirs as it emerges from the surface of the skin, very pristine volumes of uh, sweat captured non-invasively. Non so from a commercialization standpoint, uh, Gatorade reached out and, and wanted to form a partnership uh, to provide this kind of technology to their customer base to allow them to monitor how much sweat they've lost during an athletic competition or training event, and almost uh, also how much electrolyte they've lost, so that they can be, uh, you know, um, from a quantitative standpoint, informed on how much uh, water they need to consume and how much electrolytes they need to replenish at any given point to maintain proper uh, hydration uh, status.
status. And so these have been deployed on many celebrity athletes. Here's Serena Williams, and that, that's been an interesting uh, engagement and a mechanism for developing a manufacturing basis for using these devices ultimately in medical applications, which was what we're mainly interested in. And so in that domain, we're using them as uh, screens for cystic fibrosis. So alternatives to the kind of hospital monitoring approaches that are used today to measure chloride levels uh, in sweat, which is the gold standard for measuring um, you know, cystic fi fibrosis. And so working with pediatric uh, patients in, in that context, but many other applications as well. You think about sweat uh, as an alternative biofluid, maybe complementary to interstitial fluid or blood, but, but mainly attractive because it can be captured without uh, penetrating the skin. And so we have a partnership with the National Kidney Foundation to uh, you know, measure biomarkers uh, of kidney disorders in sweat, creatinine and urea uh, specifically. And so that's all I wanted to share today. I think I'm a little bit over time, but um, you know, there's a lot of uh, work happening globally these days in, in the uh, chemistry and, and material science of these novel body integrated skin integrated platforms, electronics, and microfluidics that I think will really reshape the way that we think about healthcare and patient outcomes and costs uh, of, of care. And so I'll just conclude by acknowledging the senior collaborators. We're a very collaborative group, engineering science, clinical medicine, uh, sports, but the most important people are the students and the postdocs who, who do the work. This is a picture of the group uh, that we captured during a holiday uh, party event uh, last year. And, and they're, they're really talented young uh, investigators who will go off and establish uh, their own uh, programs of research uh, in this area, thereby you know, uh, dramatically further accelerating the development of this, this technology. So th thanks again for, for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the dialogue and the, and the question and answer uh, session that will follow. Thanks, uh, John. Thanks uh, so much. Uh, it's uh, always uh, so impressive to to hear you talk about uh, your latest work. Uh, and I had the um, uh, chance to visit John's institute a few months ago. It's an amazing operation and uh, just so interdisciplinary. And it's um, um, uh, so impressive you are able to really put together so many different areas. Um, so. I have a question, John, regarding uh, applications uh, and 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 also um, uh, how you select uh, applications to work on. Uh, there are so many possibilities uh, with uh, such soft electronics and skin-inspired electronics. Uh, and how do you pick on uh, pick on which which problem to focus on, especially in uh, application area? Yeah, that that's a really great question, and. Um... Yeah, you know, I guess guess it happens in in one of two ways. Um, in in one uh, model, you know, we're we're very much integrated with our medical community here in Chicago, and and I think there's a pretty you know, widespread awareness of of some of the uh, kinds of technologies that are that are coming out of our uh, labs, and, and in many cases that that awareness leads to um, clinicians identifying areas of opportunity. So, so they kind of see papers coming out of our group. They're thinking about the challenges that they're faced with in care of their patients, uh, you know, whether it's in nephrology or dermatology or neonatology, uh, pediatrics, um, you know, older, um, you know, uh, challenges with, with uh, older uh, pa patients and so on. And so, so they'll, in, in many cases, just reach out and say, hey, you know, we have this challenge. We, we would really like to be able to make this kind of measurement. Uh, there, there's no technology available today. Do you, do you guys have anything in your lab uh, that, that might be able to address this unmet you know, clinical need. And and in some cases, you know, we have something off the shelf and, and we can start work immediately, you know, in a collaborative mode, uh, engaging with them and patients and nurses and clinical coordinators and beginning to think about how we might be able to solve their their problems. In, in other cases, maybe we have uh, an adjacent or, or related technology that's not immediately applicable, but something that we think we could modify uh, and, you um, you know, customize, I guess, to to address their their specific need, and and that will launch maybe more of kind of a, a research oriented, you know, collaborative uh, engagement. So so that's kind of one uh, mechanism, which is really kind of driven by uh, the the clinicians and 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 the hospital uh, personnel, and and that that works pr pretty well. And and I think that's most effective if you're really kind of engaged and, and embedded in, 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 in that clinical community. And so collaborations kind of build on themselves and in a sense, right, you're collaborating and then that creates additional awareness and then that creates more collaborations and pretty soon you have too many things you can even handle. So, so I have to be a little bit careful with that, but that, that turns out to be a really great mechanism. And, uh, you know, it was one of the main uh, 
motivations for for my move from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign to Northwestern is that in Urbana it was a great engineering school, but but a very tiny medical community. And and we, our hypothesis was that if we moved and came geographically co-located with an active, uh, you know, broad medical community, then then we would be in a better position to develop technologies of broader use. And that's played out really well. The other mechanism uh, is is one that's a little bit more open-ended and and we uh, as academic researchers like to um, you'll be opportunistic I guess and, and exploratory and and kind of think about uh, interesting research directions without the overhang of specific clinical requirements and specific clinical use cases. Uh, one example of that, we uh, decided, you know, there are a lot of fluids flowing in the body and being able to measure those fluid flows and the dynamics of, of those, those flows would probably be useful, but we didn't really know how that would play out. But we got interested in that and developed some flow monitoring sensors with, without a specific clinical application in mind. But but as soon as people were aware that we could do that, and I gave a presentation at a Grand Rounds uh, seminar uh, in neurological surgery and outlined all the different kinds of sensor modalities that we have. And uh, we were approached by surgeons, just one example of how this works. Uh, and they said, hey, can you modify your flow sensor, which we were developing for measuring blood flow to allow monitoring of uh, flow of cerebrospinal fluid through shunts that are used to treat hydrocephalus patients. And I'm like, what's a shunt? What's hydrocephalus? I had no idea, but but that turned out to be a great match, something that was just cooked up in an open-ended kind of academic discovery mode that later on turned out to, to really address a, a clinical uh, unmet need. So th those are the two mechanisms uh, that that uh, that we use to to define uh, projects. But but I think having that kind of uh, open-ended, unconstrained research component uh, to our broader operation is is super important, and and it's something that. Uh, is unique, uniquely enabled, I guess, by by an academic uh, environment, and uh, we like to kind of mix that in with our more kind of directed kind of kind of engineering efforts as well. Mm, okay, uh, you you also mentioned about um, the um, uh, when you develop your wearables, uh, having clinical quality wearable is really important. Can you elaborate on why it's so important? Because there are a lot of uh, wearable watches, uh, different kinds of rings, and they, they don't have FDA approval, right? Why uh, do you think clinical quality is important? Yeah, that's a, another great question, Janan. So, um, you know, in order for physicians to care for their patients, they, they need to be um, analyzing data uh, that they're familiar with and and data with which there's a deep base of uh, medical understanding. And so I think novel sensors are great and you know we we want to encourage uh, people to to work on uh, unconventional metrics of health status and and we certainly have programs in that direction. but but you really need to start with um, sensors and and platforms that can reproduce what, what physicians know and and are familiar with, and um, you know are well recognized as as metrics and parameters to to guide um, health decisions in in the care of of patients. And so, our our thought is that that uh, the best way to kind of uh, engage and and ultimately have impact over time is is to start there. Uh, with sensors that are providing those kind of well-established data streams, but but in ways that you know either eliminate noise or eliminate risk to the patients, or provide a much lower cost alternative to what's uh, being done in the hospital, or which are deployable outside of hospital and laboratory settings, which can you know capture data continuously. So not moving away from the basic data, but capturing the data in different ways and capturing different amounts of that kind of data as, as a way to sort of push and and drive uh, progress. And so. So that's kind of been our approach. And, and once you get kind of a foothold in these well-established clinically uh, recognized uh, metrics of health, then you can easily mix in to that uh, you know, set of uh, sensor modalities, so, some of these more unconventional you know, metrics. And, and so one, one example, you know, we, we have um, you know, devices that are reproducing everything that's done in terms of vital signs monitoring in, in NICU and PICU uh, facilities. But, but it's very easy for us, it turns out, on that chest unit to add a sensor that allows us to measure um, 
local biomarkers. So we can determine, you know, vibratory signatures of crying from motions of the surface of the skin. So it's not confounded by ambient noise. So you're really measuring, you know, crying dynamics and tonality. And then, you know, there's questions like, there's probably a lot of information, you know, uh, you know, in, in the form of quantitative analysis of those vocal biomarkers or maybe like respiratory sounds, digestive sounds, this kind of thing. And, and that's not uh, captured or analyzed today uh, because it's not easy to, to make that, that measurement. And so, so starting with vital signs, then you can begin to mix in these additional um, you know, metrics and these additional sensor modalities. And so I think there's tremendous academic opportunity for creative discovery around novel sensors, but, but you really have to build it on a base of what's, what's already known. And that, that, that's kind of uh, been, been our approach. It also helps establish credibility, you know, with your clinical collaborators. You can't, you know, come to them with a novel sensor. They don't know what to do with the data. And hey, what about the the standard metrics? And you don't have an answer for that. So it's it it makes it a lot easier to kind of engage and and develop uh, credibility and confidence and uh, grow grow those collaborations. So I think there's kind of a a human factors kind of uh, aspect to to it as well. It it, it just accelerates the, those kinds of um, engagements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, those are very important points. Uh, I, I think uh, next uh, is it Dr. Ha and uh, Dr. Tu will have some questions uh, uh, from Vin University. To uh, they will ask some questions. Thank you very much, Professor Jen and Bao and Professor John Rogers for uh, your reflection. And um, we will have the Q&A session next, but uh, right now, we just want to say that uh, that was a very captivating and very impressive uh, presentation that we had uh, with the Professor Rogers. Because uh, we are, all, all of us here, all the crew, and I'm sure that all the audience, we are, um, we just um, can't believe that human being, us, we are um, have, we had achieved um, those kind of development in this field of science, and uh, right now we uh, really want to ask some question. Uh, during we waiting for during waiting for the question from our audience and also from our scientists. Uh, first, um, I think um, I have one question for um, for um, Professor John Rogers. Uh, we know that uh, being a pioneer to initiate a new path of science is never easy. So we really want to um, take you back in time and to look back in the in the past. Can you share with us a very important milestone in your life, in your um, scientific journey to be uh, you uh, today? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a good question. Maybe a, a little bit of a tough one to, to answer. I, I guess maybe, maybe a couple of thoughts uh, in terms of my own journey. I think I've gotten kind of lucky. I, I don't know that um, you know much of this was was really mapped out or or planned in in a way. I, I never had a five or ten year kind of career plan around you know what what I was was hoping to do and what what my goals were. I, I guess I just kind of um, you know found found great people to work with, uh, and that that's been very important in in terms of how my career has developed. Very very much collaborative in in everything that I've all, uh, ever done, and and so I owe a lot to collaborators like Janan actually is a great, great example of that, you know, back, back at Bell Labs. I don't think we would have ever been able to build that flexible paper-like display in those days without that kind of collaborative environment. And so I think that kind of Bell Labsian um, approach to, to research and uh, engineering development has left a strong impression on me if I had to pinpoint anything specific in my career trajectory. I mean, you think about Bell Labs, it, it may have been sort of the ideal environment for doing, uh, you know, brown, groundbreaking science, scientific discovery. And that's not in, in the context of my own experience, but just historically, if you look at the number of Nobel Prizes that have been won, you know, for work do, done at, at Bell Labs, but but different than, than traditional academic research in the sense that um, it was all being done within the context of a set of engineering goals around telecommunications, you know, how do you power a satellite? Okay, that that drove the development of a solar cell, for example, or, you know, um, how do you uh, eliminate reliability concerns associated with vacuum tubes used in switching matrices for, you know, telecommunications that that drove the invention of the, the transistor, but, but built on a very deep and robust scientific uh, foundation as well. So I guess 
what we've tried to do, you know, o- over time, you know, in my group and many other groups do this well. Also, I think Janan's is a great, great example is to kind of blend science with, with engineering and think about open-ended kind of scientific discovery, but also, you know, ask the question, you know, what, what would, um, what would be the consequences of, of understanding a particular scientific uh, topic? You know, is, is there a technology outcome that could be of broader societal value? And I think that's kind of the essence of the Bell Labs sort of approach. And, you know, that, that, that really, uh, you know, represents the way that, that we aspire to do science, not that, you know, we're, we're there yet or, or, or anything of that, that sort, but, but like that, that would kind of be the goal. And, and to, um, You'll, you'll be open-minded uh, to, to opportunities as, as they arise uh, and you'll be, be flexible, right, in, in, uh, in your choice of research directions. Th- thinking about outcomes and, and problem solving rather than puzzle solving, I guess, is kind of an approach that, that we try to take with, with our research. So anyway, probably many other examples, but maybe, maybe that's answering your question, uh, at least um, to some degree. <laughs> Thank you very much for your answer. And, and we agree that the most interesting thing of, uh, be, uh, of being a scientist we, if we don't, is that we don't have a plan. Uh, and all of the, um, the great things will come along the way uh, of doing research with a scientist, right? And uh, today we have a lot of um, scientists from Vietnam. They are really excited about this topic because, you know, um, in Vietnam, this field of science is not really that developed. And we have a lot of questions just to go uh, forward and to keep up with the world. And today we have the um, participation from the Vietnam uh, Hanoi Medical University, Vietnam Korea Institute of Science Technology, Ho Chi Minh City University of Science, Hanoi University of Science, uh, Vinmec International Hospital, uh, and uh, from Fenica University, um, Hanoi University of Science and Technology, and also Queen Yun University. And we also have the um, participation from the University of Queensland and uh, from other the University of New South Wales. And right now, uh, for the first question, I would like to in invite um, Professor Huang Mai Ha from the Institute of Chemistry, Vietnam Academy of Science and Technology will have a question for Professor Rogers. Please, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor Rogers, for very interesting lectures. So I'm so curious about the power supply for the system and also the, the signal transformation, the, 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 the data transformation of this system, of your system. And what kind of uh, electric uh, connecting material do you use for this uh, system? Yeah, we, we try to use whatever class of material we think is going to offer us the, the highest levels of performance and, um, you know, with, with robust operational characteristics. And also, you know, thinking about cost, what, what is manufacturable? And, um, you know, what, what can kind of, uh, what choices of materials can kind of align with the consumer electronics uh, industry specifically this program with gates really opened our eyes toward um, you know topics in cost I, I think it's a very important metric sometimes uh, gets gets overlooked um, you know if you develop an advanced material or a specialized technology and it can only be used in wealthy countries then then I think you kind of miss the point at, at, at a certain level so so we think about performance not only in terms of fidelity and signal acquisition and all uh, parameters related to the operation of the sensors but but also the the cost and so for the devices that we've deployed into these lower and middle income countries um, for the most part the conducting elements are made of copper but but copper um, you know configured in uh, novel geometries um, uh, that you know, when embedded in a soft elastomer matrix, you know, provides these kind of effective stretchable characteristics, even though copper itself is not stretchable. So, so that that's kind of the the design approach in in, in principle, and and maybe one example of that. It would also apply to to silicon, for, for example. So, so we try to kind of leverage what what's known uh, from from a material standpoint, a manufacturing standpoint, but but deploy those materials in unusual combinations. And in unusual uh, geometries, and, and I think uh, new materials are great also, and and they will have a very important role uh, to play. Uh, but I but I think you have to be strategic about where a new material is really going to add function or reduce cost or improve uh, reliability, and and where it may be 
you know, a little bit less critical, let, let's say, you know, to the overall operation of the system. So, so to kind of extend your question, I would say there, there are a lot of uh, great, um, you know, academic research efforts in, in stretchable uh, conductors. And I think it's super uh, interesting. And uh, I think over time, you know, those, those classes of materials may be great alternatives um, uh, to, to copper, for example, back, back to your question as, as an interconnect. Uh, you know, conductor in in these systems, and I, I we have confidence that 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 it will play out uh, in in that direction. But but new materials can also be uh, enabling uh, at a more fundamental level in sensor technologies, and I think specifically in biochemical sensors, um, new materials are absolutely required. You know, you're just not going to be able to do it, you know, with standard uh, you know electronic materials that serve the consumer electronics gadgetry industry because there's really no need for chemical sensors and cell phone you know for the most part to my knowledge anyway <laughs> so i so i think you know if, if you're thinking about novel materials maybe you know materials that uh you'll know, provide that kind of biochemical sensing functionality could could be very powerful not not exclusively but but if you think about like a hierarchy of pri priorities my my opinion is there's a lot of unknown uh you know issues and unsolved challenges around chemical sensing and, and i think new new chemistries are going to be absolutely required and and so so i think there are there are many opportunities and and uh, you know th those are some thoughts okay. yeah. thank you professor thank you dr ha uh, for your question and uh, right now we will come back to professor john rogers uh, professor rogers we have a surprise for you right now we will have a reunion in today's webinar um, we will have uh, a question from a scientist also a professor from hanoi university of science but he's also a phd student of you oh, yes. of, of yours yeah. um, years ago and right now let's find out if you can still remember him or not Please, oh, professor? absolutely. Too, too Trong. I was going to call him out, but I was, uh, wasn't aware if he's going to be on this call. I don't want to embarrass him, but <laughs> yeah, we, I haven't talked to, to Tu in a little while, but he was a great graduate student when I was back at uh, University of Illinois. And then I think he did a postdoc at Argonne National Labs. And so uh, great to see you, too. Yeah, it doesn't take you even like uh, a second to remember him. And right now, let's talk to uh, Professor Chung Teng Tu from Hanoi University of Science. Thank you, Chang. And uh, it's very nice to meet you again, uh, Professor Rogers. And uh, uh, so uh, today I'm, I'm not in Hanoi, but I'm, I'm in Mali, Indonesia. And it's very nice to meet you from here <laughs> as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, um, uh, I actually have uh, have some a couple of questions for you. And uh, but uh, some part of the, your uh, my question already uh, covered. Uh, some part right? uh, so the first question is uh, i can see a lot of potential for the application of the devices you're making uh, and uh, so I, I also saw that you uh, deploy the application in uh, uh, several places around the world and i love to see uh, some application in vietnam as well in the near future and uh, so I'm, I'm wondering uh, are the devices uh, commercially available right now and uh, um, what what cause what could be the uh, the main challenges to make them commercially available? Uh, so that's my first question. The second one is um, I always admire your work uh, uh, doing uh, collaboration with other scientists around the world and in the U.S. And uh, it's a kind of a model for us as the uh, young uh, faculty in our uh, in Vietnam as well around the world. And um, so. Uh, um, I, I I just want to uh, to have you uh, uh, to give us some uh, advice or guideline how to uh, uh, coordinate such a huge uh, collaboration in research. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Again, great, great to see you uh, too. You you look exactly the same. You haven't aged a single day. I have all this gray hair now. I I don't see any evidence of aging with you. So something about your lifestyle. I need to learn learn something from you on that. <laughs> But uh, any, anyway, so yeah, two questions, commercialization and collaboration. So <clears throat> from a commercialization standpoint, you know, uh, we do have FDA approval, two, two sets of approvals, uh, var various, uh, you know, indications, um, you know, a fair amount of funding into that company. It's not a traditional VC uh, venture capital backed uh, company. It's, it's not set up in that way. Uh, we don't have any MBAs, no business people at all, it's just engineers and 
uh, medical doctors uh, with with the company. So so it's a little bit different in that sense. But you know, um, engagements the Gates and Save the Children, Merck for Mothers, uh, Steel uh, Family Foundation. Um, you know, have have uh, been 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 really um, you know instrumental to, to the development of that that company, and and I mentioned you know th thousands of transistors, tens of thousands of patients have been uh, monitored, quarter of a million hours of uh, monitoring data, and so on, and and the focus is really on neonatal, pediatric, maternal, fetal health. That that's the mission, and to think about how we can um, you know develop technologies that that reduce rates of mortality. Associated with childbirth and and uh, improve health outcomes uh, at the earliest stages of life is is kind of what we're doing. It's kind of an underserved uh, population, interestingly enough, uh, because you know I think in the U.S. at least you know premature babies don't represent a multi-billion-dollar market, and so uh, you know I think there there hasn't been a lot of capital put put into the development of technologies that address uh, the needs of those. Very, very important uh, patients. So, so we're kind of fo focusing on that. So, so it is commercial. We have uh, partnerships also on on the commercial side with Draeger, uh, GE, and Space Labs. Uh, so, those are companies that supply monitoring equipment, uh, incubators into NICU and PICU facilities around the world. So, so we have the right partnerships. I think as a small company, you can't sell directly into hospitals effectively. So, so we really need to do those partnerships and. Uh, that they also provide a mechanism for for funding uh, the company. So we'll see how it goes. You know, it's always hard to tell. I, I would say that we're on a very good track and, and maybe we hit hit a brick wall that we didn't anticipate, whatever, a lot, a lot of ways for things to fail, but but I'm pretty optimistic and, and things are on a good track and uh, they're well-funded and well-staffed and they have great people and, uh, you know, they have a mechanism for for generating additional FDA approvals. So so that's kind of where things are. Cybel Health is the name of the company. You can go to the website if you're interested. That's decoupled it's not associated with my academic group there's a there's a clear separation there but uh, but i'm on the board and you know have some day-to-day -day, uh in, involvement but not at a managerial uh level just just uh, advisory level in terms of uh collaboration i think um you know the, the key is to find find um you know collaborators that that have expertise that complement your own you know so uh, i have great co colleagues here in, in the department of material science but like i'm a material scientist so so my best collaborators are in other fields of study that that you know neuroscience for example or clinical care I talked a lot about neonatology dermatology of uh, joint appointments various uh, you know departments in the medical school biomedical engineering computer science for machine learning so i think collaborations my experience work best when you have two groups with disparate but complementary skill sets coming together. Uh, and it improves the outcomes of, of the cl collaboration, but it also you know, helps you navigate uh, sometimes difficulties associated with authorship and ownership and who gets credit and, and that kind of thing be because you're addressing different communities. So, so I go to material science uh, you know, conferences and, you know, my collaborators are going to medical conferences. And so we're not stepping on each other's toes. And so I think just from an interpersonal relationship standpoint, that's helpful. It's really helpful. Uh, maybe more so for the students than the, than the faculty at this point. I think we're old enough. We don't really care that much, at least for me in terms of credit, but, but the students are trying to establish an identity and I get that. And so, so I think, I think that that's a very important part of it. And, that that's worked pretty well for us over the years. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Thu, uh, for your participation. And uh, Professor Rogers, we hope that with um, uh, Professor Thu joining us today, having him joining us today, uh, we can remind you of some beautiful old days memory um, with your PhD, Vietnamese PhD uh, student. And uh, right now, he's uh, a very successful and um, very um, famous and well-known scientist in Vietnam. And you must be very proud of your student. Uh, right now, we will come back to uh, today's webinar. We have a lot of questions is waiting for you. The next question uh, will be sent by Professor Nguyen Đức Chien from Hanoi University of Science and Technology. Please, Professor. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Rogers. Uh, I'm uh, from Hanoi University of Science and Technology. I'm also a member of uh, Vietnam Physical Society, Vietnam Material Research Society. I would have a possibility uh, to meet you uh, 
in uh, 2011 when i was in your i you uh, you are you see for two months <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, Great. I, I try to join to you after your lecture, but I could not because uh, when I come to your lecture, I met only only your assistant. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Great. So I was always impressed by uh, the team of uh, your re team research. Uh, I didn't. I was very very impressed by uh, your publication every year. From ten to twenty publication in science and in and uh, in nature. This uh, the qu first question is uh, when we were in uh, UIUC, you have very big uh, research team with more than twenty PhD students and more than twenty postdoc. And then you move to uh, Northwestern University. Uh, the question is not uh, really related to the topic, but how about this uh, PhD student and uh, postdoc when you left the 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 you <laughs> you see? <laughs> well, that that's a great question. You know, I, I was very concerned about about the move. You know, I think from a career standpoint, it was something that we kind of you know, needed to do to get, as I mentioned before, more, you know, closely coupled into a medical community. And uh, that's been fantastic. I and mean, we try to have impact on patients. You got to be uh, engaged with with that community. And uh, that that's worked out better than I could have possibly imagined. So, so that, I mean, even though, you know, U of I was great, great colleagues, we did very mm -hmm. well there. It was a wonderful place, but, you know, got, got to be engaged with the medical community. You want to do serious things, you got to do it. And, and so, so that was a motivation, but, but I was very concerned about disruption to, to the students and, and the postdocs, because uh, for me, I'm thinking about a move on a 20, 30 year time scale, but for them, it's more like a two, one or, you know, year time scale. And that, that can be very pro problematic. So I think moving to Northwestern was great because it's just within driving distance uh, of Urbana. So my colleagues back at U of I were very gracious and, and allowed me to keep a lot of my lab space, essentially all of my lab space, you know, for the first two, three years. And, and so I would uh, drive down to Urbana. Uh, I spent a day every other week uh, down, down in Urbana interacting with the students. I gave everybody the opportunity to move to Northwestern, but you want to stay in Urbana, finish up, you can do that as well. So, so that was really important to minimize the disruption for, for the students. And uh, it allowed us to kind of gradually uh, move the research group. We didn't have to pick it up in one shot and, and move it in, in that way. And so I actually just finally cleaned out my, my lab spaces, uh, you know, last summer, summer of 2021. And so, you know, that that was great. I really got to thank my colleagues back at U of I. Paul Braun in particular is director of the Materials La uh, Research Lab for, for allowing me to maintain a footprint there. And so, so everybody was able to kind of finish up very, very minimal, you know, dislocation and, and everybody uh, did well, but, but that was a consideration. You know, I wanted to move to some place that got, got us integrated with the medical community, but at the same time, you know, allowed the students and postdocs to finish up and move on to the next stages of their careers without, you know, uh, a, a negative effect associated with a move. So, so that, that's the way it worked out. I guess I had lab space uh, for nearly five, five years. I mean, a, a gradually reducing my footprint over time, obviously, but that, that's a great question. I thought a lot about it. <laughs> Thank you. It's the second question. Uh, when you make your electronic circuits, what, what technology you use, you still, you still use the, uh, Photo lithography or other more advanced lithography to, to make the circuits? All different kinds of approaches, I guess. Again, may, maybe the mindset is similar to the one that I described in the context of uh, material choices. If there's a manufacturing approach that's already established and it applies to our systems, we want to use that. We, we don't want to reinvent that. Uh, and, and if there's a gap then in capabilities and, and we need to be able to manufacture uh, using a process that's not already commercial, then, then we develop that. And so I would say, you know, um, the, the most important component that's non-traditional in, in the manufacturing flow is um, kind of a soft lithography inspired 
way to uh, trans uh, transfer materials from from one place to another. It's a, sort of a, uses a soft stamp, and we can uh, we can print solid material structures uh, in that way. And it extends uh, what is done at an industrial scale using pick and place machines, but but it allows us to to move uh, materials with much higher throughput. And we can manipulate material elements that are much smaller than those that can be uh, addressed with a robotic uh, pick and place tool like, like you would see in an industrial manufacturing uh, line. So, so that might be an example of uh, an advanced manufacturing technique that's emerged from our group and is used uh, broadly uh, these, these days to, to address a, a gap, I guess, in, in manufacturing capabilities. But, but in other instances, we'll just use photolithography. It's fine. We can etch different kinds of materials, pattern them in that way. We, we have been uh, working on laser ablation-based approaches, specifically in these um, bioresorbable implantable devices. I didn't talk about those, but it's a different uh, platform. And, and there, those materials are water-soluble. They're designed to dissolve in biofluids. And as a result, they're incompatible with a lot of the steps that are used in semiconductor manufacturing. So dry processing is uh, is kind of a requirement and, and using high resolution laser ablation approaches in multi-layer geometries tur turns out to be a great uh, a great alternative and, and that's kind of a manufacturing scheme that we're working on now. But that kind of transfer printing, that soft lithography approach to manip manipulating materials, probably a good example uh, to, to address your question. Okay, thank you very much. I hope to see you in, uh, once in Vietnam. Huh? Yes, definitely, yeah, look forward to that. Thank you very much, Professor Chin, for your question. And uh, right now, we, we still have one uh, question for you, Professor Rogers from Sydney, Australia. Please uh, let us invite Professor Huang Fu Fan from UNSW. Hi, Professor, professor Huang Rogers Fan, and hi, hi, Professor Baus. Uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing your time in this web seminar today. And good to see you again. Yeah, and, uh, yeah hey. Yeah. I was lucky to uh, work at both UIUC and uh, Northwestern University. Um, even I visited for a, a short period of times, and I visited, uh, I have meeting with you at Bond University as well. So those were very wonderful uh, experience for me, and I really uh, appreciate that. So uh, my first question, I think already asked by um, Professor Tu, but I just wonder, um, you already deployed your wearable technology in um, India and uh, Africa through the um, Gate Foundation. Um, so do you have any plans to deploy your technology in Southeast Asia, like Vietnam and uh, other countries? Because I think uh, people are here, um, especially for those who are living in remote areas, don't have the access to the hospital. So uh, kind of telehealth uh, technology would benefit them. So um, the first, that's the first question. Uh, the second one um, is you mentioned about um, silicon material is still the mainstream material um, for commercial electronics. So that's why you also employ silicon for your uh, wearable platforms. But I, I just wonder the cost of the material will come not only from the manufacturing, but also from the assembly process. And I guess the assembly process for wearable electronic or flexible device would be different from that of the conventional resist platform. So how can you um, enhance the manufacturing process so that you can uh, scale up the, 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 the mass production and reduce the cost of the device so that it can be uh, accessible to people in developing countries? Yeah, yeah. So, so great, great questions. We, we would love to deploy into Southeast Asia and, and Vietnam and other places. We, we, I kind of respond to opportunities where there's um, you know some kind of financial mechanism to support the work and and the deployment. Um, you know, we're we're not in a position at this scale of our company to um, to initiate those those deployments ourselves. So it needs to be sort of a maybe a, a collaboration with the local government or like the Gates Foundation, other foundations, non governmental organizations, and. Uh, We've been very effective in, in in partnering partnering with those kinds of groups because they also have infrastructure on the ground uh, to to support you know training and uh, continued uh, sort of 
uh, support and, and maintenance of the of the devices. So so we we can't do it alone. You know we we need partnerships, and uh, you know where we're deployed in the country uh, in, in across the world, the, the specific countries are dictated by by where those those partnerships exist. And um, yeah, I guess we're we're a little bit more um, responsive to to inbound requests for deployments as opposed to proactively submitting proposals and, and things like that. So so Gates just came to us and then we just did did it uh with, without you know with without the overhead of, of trying to sell someone on on a on a deployment. And so if if there are groups in Vietnam or others we you know who are interested and in, and in, you know ha have the capability to to provide the financial and the personnel support then then we would love to have a conversation around around a partnership you know we're we're looking to to expand and uh build on um, the deployments that, that are already in place but but that's kind of how how it works um you know we don't have a business development team let's say running around trying to find where where we can deploy next we we have our hands full right now and uh if if people want to want to do something, then they 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 can approach us, and we we have have that conversation. It's, it's great, you know. Ultimately, you know, we we want the broadest deployment possible because we think these technologies can be important in reducing death and uh, improving you know pa patient uh, out outcomes. So so that that's kind of uh, a generic uh, answer. Um, you know, as as an example of that there was a. a Philanthropist who um, you know had a vision of a wireless uh, NICU unit at a um, Montreal a Children's Hospital associated with McGill. So he had funding, and uh, we're engaged with them, and we're doing the first uh, fully wireless NICU um, uh, monitoring room uh, with them. So so that that's kind of <clears throat> how it works. In terms of manufacturing, I I would say there there probably isn't uh, as large a gap as as you might think. Um, you know, there's a pretty well developed industry and in flex flexible printed cir circuit board technology, and that that's kind of a primitive class of fe flexible electronics, I guess. But it's a starting point, and there are manufacturers who who do flexible PCBs, and uh, and we team with them. We we can't simply you know use their processes without modification, but it's a great starting point. And it gets us uh, down the path of a volume cost effective manufacturing flow and we modify things we do certain steps in house but but we we partner with existing manufacturing companies and so so we can do that in terms of the cost structure you you think about it the way the Gates Foundation thinks about it is the cost per patient monitoring day. Uh, and that needs to be in the realm of uh, since uh, us since. So you know, small fraction of a dollar per day is 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 kind of where where you need to be in terms of cost, and so so that's the cost modeling that we do. Uh, we're not there now because we're not uh, at volume manufacturing, so we're doing thousands of devices, but not millions. You know, you need you need to really really scale the manufacturing. The cost correlates very tightly with volume, and so mm -hmm. so you have to make cer certain kinds of projections and so on. But but it looks like you you can get there. Uh, but but what we're doing today is not a few cents per patient monitoring day because it's just you know at a much smaller scale than than one would ultimately need to achieve to reach those cost targets. But but they they're you know involved in those cost projections. I think it's very very reasonable set of assumptions and you know based based on what we can do today, not projections of what might be possible in terms of manufacturing in the future. It's like what's here and now today. And what would that look like if you we're doing volumes of millions of units, and then you pencil out the costs, and you get get into a pretty good spot uh, based based on that. Um, but you know, new manufacturing processes could also uh, you know always you know offer potential for re further reducing the cost. So I don't want to give the impression that it's a solved problem. You know, you can always improve things, but but at least we're in a realm where it makes sense already. You know, and and. Uh, and think things are only going to get better, you know, in into the future. Not only in terms of cost, but reliability and uh, you know operational uh, you know options and sensor types and things like that. So very much a starting point, just the very first stages of uh, you know development in this direction. Tremendous uh, opportunities for further research and innovation uh, around the materials, the manufacturing, the sensor designs, uh, really every aspect of the overall system. Data analytics as well is hu huge opportunities there. AI machine learning. Thank you. Good to see you. <laughs> see you.
Thank you, Professor Huang Feng Fan, and thank you, uh, for, uh, Professor John Rogers, for your answer. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, our beloved scientists, we also have um, our chair of today's webinar as a pioneer of this field uh, of organic uh, polymer-based uh, electronics. And today, we also have a question for Professor Jin An Bao uh, with the question from Dr. Phan Dit Lan from the Vietnam Korea Institute of Science and Technology. Um, we would like to invite Professor Jin Anba to, ask the, uh, to answer the question. How long does the soft electronic system like yours and Professor Rogers could work, meaning the system lifetime, and how you provide energy to your electronic system? If it's the battery, please tell the type, size, or how long it could run until the next charging, as well as the circuits for data transmission, Bluetooth or wireless, or something else. Yeah, that's the question. Please, Professor mm -hmm. Jin Anba. Well, thanks uh, for the question. Uh, the, uh, as for how long the um, uh, device can run it uh, uh, without the power uh, being the consideration, just the materials themselves, uh, it depends very much on the uh, actual materials that have been incorporated. In some cases, uh, we may want to have uh, biodegradable. Uh, devices uh, and then the materials are designed uh, uh, to be biodegradable. For example, John's group have shown uh, inorganic, uh, even inorganic materials can be made biodegradable. And uh, my group has been focusing on organic materials that are biodegradable. And uh, the degradation time is tunable depending on the actual application uh, they're intended for. And then for, for battery life, uh, it's, a, it, it's a complicated um, uh, issue to consider because it depends on uh, the uh, power consumption of the, um, uh, of the overall system. And that can include uh, the sensing. Typically sensing doesn't really take too much power, uh, but then uh, the um, memory uh, to store the data can take a lot of power. Uh, and also uh, the wireless transmission can potentially take a lot of power. Uh, so um, uh, this uh, uh, consideration of the battery really depends on uh, what is the intended application and uh, uh, then the overall uh, system level consideration. Uh, there are a few approaches. So for example, in uh, John's group, uh, they have shown a variety of different uh, NFC based um, uh, devices where you can remotely power. And in my group, we have been working on what we call body net type of um, uh, passive wireless devices where uh, the sensors are basically incorporated onto stickers uh, and then the readers are, are nearby that can be used to power and read out the sensors. And that can help to reduce the size of the actual patch uh, and uh, integrate or truly take advantage of the uh, uh, conformal ability of uh, uh, new materials. Thank you very much, Professor Jin and Bao. We all know that uh, besides uh, the presentation and also the development of uh, the material, um, we, we have heard about from Professor John Rogers. We also know that you are developing novel materials and uh, e-skin, uh, the, the one that you uh, have won the um, awards from Green Future Prize, right? And um, we really, um, we, we still remember in the recent uh, interview with Green Future, you have told us that as a researcher, uh, don't be afraid of uh, commercialization. More than anyone, you understand the challenge uh, of uh, the challenge and the gap, the distance between clinical phase and commercialization. Can you share with us the biggest challenge and the biggest obstacle uh, to commercialize all the uh, the, uh, the research? Mm -hmm. Well, for uh, well, I, I'm still learning uh, in the process of um, uh, uh, spinning off um, <coughs> companies or licensing our technologies. Uh, uh, basically, the um, uh, for research, uh, our goal is to uh, to invent uh, things that didn't exist before and uh, to do the um, uh, most exciting science and uh, uh, engineering. But for commercialization, 
there's a, a very important consideration of uh, uh, the um, uh, potential market. How big is the market and what is the appropriate business model that can uh, take a invention into commercialization in a pathway that, um, uh, that, that both can attract funding to sustain it, but also at the same time, uh, being able to, to utilize uh, the most advanced technology. Uh, so uh, sometimes it may not always be matching because uh, uh, by definition for new technologies, a new science, it might be creating a new market, uh, but then that new market is not, not a proven market and for investors, uh, uh, then they, they view it as very risky and they don't know how to how how to uh, price uh, the uh, that market and uh, making it difficult for scientists uh, to to raise funding uh, to try to to make a product uh, for a new market. So it's still something that um, uh, that I'm learning through experience. Uh, um, uh, but um, uh, uh, well, there there's no fixed model. I think for each invention, there there is a, um, a potential commercialization. Uh, pathway. Uh, so um, yeah, it's very much uh, also an experiment by itself. Yeah, that's a very useful tips and advice for our young researchers if they are being afraid of uh, commercialization. And uh, right now we come back to the webinar today uh, for the last part of today's webinar. We really want to ask uh, for the feeling of our distinguished speaker, Professor Rogers. I know now it's uh, very late uh, at your time, right? And what do you think uh, about today's webinar and the participation of all of our audience? Well, it was great. I, I very much enjoyed it. Um, they're great questions, uh, you know, fantastic engagement. And, um, you know, it was uh, wonderful to see Janan uh, again. Uh, we bump into each other pretty regularly at conferences, but I always enjoy the interactions, even though it's virtual at this point, but just uh, he hearing her thoughts and Hearing her answers to some of these uh, some of these questions has been fantastic, and I think this Vin Futures program that that you guys have put together there in Vietnam is 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 really really powerful, and it's uh, well recognized, tremendous visibility worldwide. And so, congratulations on this uh, initiative, and thank you again for inviting me to to uh, you know participate in this in this webinar. Thank you, Professor Rogers. Thank you, Professor Jin and Bao. We have learned a lot from uh, your sharings, and more than that, I think uh, we, uh, all of our scientists, our audience, have been inspired a lot by your scientific journey, and they will have more inspiration to keep moving forward, to um, to do more, and uh, to dare to do more in their research um, career. And uh, for our distinguished uh, guest and also our audience, thank you very much for being with us for all the whole series, for the whole series of uh, the Vin Future Innovator webinar series. And uh, we will come back soon, very soon, for other scientific activities uh, next year. And um, please uh, wait for the very big events of uh, Vin Future in the end of this year. The Vin Future uh, Prize Award Ceremony will be uh, will take place in December 20th and also the scientific um, and technology week will um, uh, will be uh, held from uh, 17 to 21 21st of December this year and uh, we will come back soon and um, see you very soon with other projects of in future for right now uh, please share with us your command your uh, thoughts and all your um, ideas and also uh, what you think that we can uh, do to to um, progress better, to um, to improve uh, in the next season or uh, in the next project uh, of in future, we share in the uh, survey uh, link we have in the chat box uh, under the chat box. And uh, for right now, thank you, our chair of the webinar. Thank you, distinguished guests. Thank you, all our beloved scientists and audience. Goodbye, and see you very soon. Bye bye. <laughs>